Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Wood, and I am the Director of Start and Scale Programming here at Communitech. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's AMA session. I'm very excited to have Lena Birch and Kristen Gillette from Birch Gillette join us today for a look at the evolution of events as we're seeing them unfold in 2020 as a result of COVID-19. Before I turn things over to Kristen and Lena, I have a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded so that um, it's viewable by companies um, after the event. So you can find all of our previous AMA recordings at communitech.ca if you search Ask Me Anything in the search bar. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Kristen and Lena to take us through a look at events um, in 2020. Thank you. I'm Lena Birch. Kristen and I are co-owners of Birch Gillette Inc., a company that delivers high quality, tailored events for companies of all sizes, from corporate to not-for-profit, in Waterloo Region and beyond. My experience spans over 20 years, and my passion is in operations and project management. I started at an agency and worked there for 16 years in various operational roles, from human resources to IT, to finance, talent acquisition, and digital. I was most recently at Communitech as senior project manager on the events team, working primarily on the True North Conference, Waterloo Region's global tech conference and festival. Hi, I'm Kristen Gillette. I've been in the event industry for over 16 years. I started my career at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment as the manager of live events, where we focused on concerts and special events. Before Lena and I started this company, I was the director of events at Communitech. During my time there, I was fortunate enough to lead the True North team through the ideation phase all the way through to execution in the first two years. We brought 2,500 people a year to the region. Together, Lena and I specialize in delivering seamlessly executed events that go beyond the status quo and bring your narrative to life, or at least that was the plan. In a matter of months, our lives have changed, the way we socialize, the way we do business, the way that we're educating our children, and the way we're executing and hosting events. The word that we keep hearing is unprecedented, and we all hate it, but we've had to pivot, and we've had to pivot fast. An entire industry has been wiped out. The event industry from entire production crews to housekeeping to venues and caterers, transportation, they've all been wiped out. So we went from large conferences and gatherings of thousands of people packed into the same room together to our new reality of empty event venues. In 2020, the new event venue has actually become sound stages, studios, and virtual environments. We look forward to the day when we can get back to in-person connections and live experiences. In the meantime, we are all pivoting to virtual events, and there is so much information out there. Event services companies and on-site event app development companies have turned to developing virtual platforms. Production companies now have video offerings. Trade show organizers have turned to virtual trade show platforms. And com any companies looking to host events need to educate themselves on what events look like now versus what they could look like six to eight months from now. Today, we want to talk to you about how the virtual and hybrid event worlds have provided companies and event organizers an opportunity to get creative. It has challenged us to find new, exciting ways to provide attendees with experiences and to maintain fleeting attention spans from internal meetings to external customer and sales meetings. We'll talk about how to set your organizations and brands apart and how to continue to elevate yourselves as thought leaders in the absence of live experiences. And at the end of the session, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Even though we can't gather in person the same way we used to, a virtual event can still deliver on the same goals as in-person events. The general purpose of any event is to deliver your message, product, or information in an engaging and experiential way. By doing that, you can drive leads that could eventually convert to revenue. You may need to drive adoption for old and new customers, which in turn can build customer loyalty. Hosting or participating in events is a great way to get your subject matter experts in front of potential or current customers and demonstrate thought leadership and expertise in your field. Since March, we've all tried to navigate through how it's going to look like to host and execute events through this post-COVID era and during a pandemic. And we've started to discover that there's some real benefits that these virtual platforms can provide us. 
These opportunities are both immediate as well as long term. And some of the benefits of eventing virtually is the fact that it gives you access to a broader audience immediately. You no longer have to be concerned with the company's reduced travel budgets, crossing borders, travel delays, the extra time people need of their work schedules to come to your event. So your event becomes a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Venue capacity used to dictate the number of people that could attend your event, which is not an issue with virtual. The timeline required to plan a virtual event is a lot shorter compared to those in person. So things can come together a lot faster with a lot less lead time, simply because many of the logistical aspects are removed. We no longer have to think about the food and beverage experience, dietary restrictions, room setup, transportation, parking, venue, contracts, weather, load in and load out. Um, and the last but not least, virtual removes all health and safety risks. In many ways, there's a silver lining, but it can also be a curse. Organizations are pulling, to, pulling these virtual events and meetings together quickly, but they're forgetting the fundamentals of running awesome events virtual or in-person, the attendee experience always has to remain high on the priority list. All of the, our traditional events can be done in a virtual world. Nothing has been untouched. From webinars, which are typically shorter time frames, around 45 to 120 minutes, they have one or more speakers, to conferences, which in some cases are multi-day, with many speakers, and they include various delegate experiences, to meetings, both internally and externally focused to trade shows with virtual booths, as well as fundraisers with online and live auctions, entertainment, and various forms of donation collection. Regardless of the type of event, the fundamentals around planning an event remain the same. Take your budget, for example. For in-person events, a portion of your budget is allocated to venue, delegate experience, and food and beverage. But with a virtual event, your budget is adjusted to remove the venue and F&B and some of the in-person experiential items, and those dollars are redirected into your content as well as your technology platform. It's important to note here that these budgets probably won't be dollar for dollar. You don't need to spend the same money on a virtual event as an in-person event, but you do need to spend some money. Your marketing spend and efforts won't go away. Depending on the type of event you're running, you still want and need to promote it. Those promotions may still include the various forms of marketing communications that you've typically used, like an event website, email campaigns, or digital ads to name a few. And you're still going to have communications happening at every stage of your event. Depending on the type of event and size, you'll scale these accordingly from pre-event communications, which typically include confirmations, know before you go, or in the virtual case, know before you participate, and teasing your content through to your communications during the event with information on where to find help, how to engage with moderators, speakers, and other participants, and then of course your post-event communications with a thank you, a survey, and in some cases, promotion of your next event. So near to and dear to my heart is the event content. It always has to be important, and regardless of the type of event you're having, you really have to think it through. You need diverse speakers with great content and curated opportunities. Now planners need to be very cognizant of how an attendee's attention span differs between an in-person and a virtual event. Sessions need to be a lot shorter and way more dynamic. An in-person event agenda doesn't translate well over into the virtual world. If you think about a past experience of watching someone deliver a keynote presentation on stage while sitting in a seat, you have a venue, you're surrounded by people, and there's a real vibe. Now think about that same keynote and you're at home and your excitement level really wanes. Planners no longer have the luxury of using that energy of the crowd to play off of. They have to be even more strategic when putting their agendas together. To curate the at-home agenda, you'll need to think about how to make it more energetic, to the point, and fast-paced. Virtual audiences won't tolerate that slow build up to the point. Therefore, sessions need to be shorter. When selecting speakers, make sure that they have a strong presenting persona. An engaging on-screen host or MC can also help move things along and tie everything together. As well, include entertainment between sessions, moving graphics um, when going from session to session, and breaks can no longer be unprogrammed. Every second you have someone online for your event, there has got to be an experience for them to enjoy. Just because somebody's watching at home on their own doesn't mean it has to be a lonely or boring experience for them. With customized content delivered in multiple ways, it helps maintain the attendees' engagement. 
Mix it up with live stream keynotes, pre-recorded interviews. Use the breakout format sessions, which helps uh, provide a more collaborative experience using live question and answer and whiteboarding capabilities. A virtual event experience should also incorporate really meaningful networking opportunities. Networking has always been that high value reason that people get together and attend events. Luckily, virtual events can still provide this function. And by using platforms that provide dedicated networking spaces, the use of direct messaging uh, among the attendees, um, the ability to build out your attendee profile to help them find meaningful connections with others, the platform you choose ultimately becomes your event venue. Do the research. You need to select a technology platform that's really easy for you to use. And depending on the complexity of the event and the resources you have to work with, think about a platform that you can integrate with other virtual platforms seamlessly. My suggestion is that depending on the size and scale of the event, if you are currently working on a platform for conducting meetings virtually, look into how they can upgrade and add on features. Because you're delivering an experience on screen, attendees have an expectation of how they digest that experience. Our minds are programmed for television, and to keep your event attendees engaged, your event needs to run like a broadcast. We mentioned earlier the effect that COVID has had on the event, hospitality, entertainment industry, and the fact that many people and places have been displaced. There is a big opportunity now for service providers, and they're shifting to offer their spaces as studios. The event venue of 2020 and beyond looks very different and needs to include considerations around physical space for distancing and dedicated entrances and exits. Today, Kristen and I are at Sherwood Systems on Ottawa Street in Kitchener. We are physically distanced, and Sherwood has turned part of their warehouse into a studio space for us. I've always been a big believer about being really kind to your speakers. So even if you're planning an internal town hall meeting, provide those who are speaking with tips and tricks needed so that they can put their best foot forward on camera. Remember, not all your speakers are going to be super confident and comfortable. So you want to try to eliminate as many unknowns as you can. Think about booking a studio like we did. A little bit of professional support goes a long way, and especially if the speaker is nervous about the technical side of the presentation, which we've all been there. We've all been thrown off our game, not knowing how to fix an AV problem that's gone awry. If possible, take that off the speaker's plate so they can put all their energy and focus into their presentation. If you've invited anyone external to participate in a meeting or event, think through the experience that they're going to have as a presenter. Everyone loves swag, and sending them a small gift of equipment, preferably branded, uh, will definitely be appreciated. Include things like a small uplight, an Ethernet adapter so that they can hardwire into their internet, an external lapel mic with their um, to enhance their sound. Anything you can think of that makes the speaker look confident and professional. Provide the speaker with a guide or a how-to to be on camera, their positioning, the background, the lighting, what they should be wearing. A dress rehearsal, they're important and probably mandatory and worth the extra time. Provide a speaker handler for them, somebody that's there to help them through the process during the entire event, pre, post, and during. Provide a presentation document, all the things they need to know, including format requirements, length, question and answer format. Use a studio that already has a proper setup and potentially a cool set setup. And maybe do something fun. Paying attention to the details and making small tweaks will go a long way in helping your speakers put their best foot forward. In person or virtual, these elements always need to be thought through and well communicated to the speakers. With things slowly starting to open up, hybrid events, a combination of in-person and virtual events, will start to happen. Hybrid can be done for all different types of events, webinars, conferences, meetings, etc. Executing a hybrid event requires two separate and defined experiences. As an event planner, you wear two hats, one of a planner and one of a broadcast producers. Your live attendees and your virtual attendees need to be thought of differently, and your content needs to be structured to maintain engagement for those attending both the in-person event and the ones attending virtually. The virtual experience cannot be an afterthought or second-tiered. For the in-person experience, you'll need to consider COVID restrictions and what that on-site experience is. Your venue needs to have the space for a physically distanced gathering. Food and beverage can no longer be a self-serve buffet line. Event check-in needs to allow for two meter apart lines and will likely need to include a screening process with signed waivers and health declarations from your attendees. As well, your emergency preparedness plan will need to include a communication plan around contact tracing. Staff will need PPE, 
plexi dividers may be needed at check-in and information desks. Sanitation and cleaning will need to be increased and masks are mandatory. As planners, we need to be cognizant of potential bottlenecks and flow throughout the in-person event. Think about how your event agenda is set up and how you make tweaks that can help alleviate crowds in any given spot. For example, it might not be the best idea to start the day off with a huge keynote since registration lines will be busy and crowded as people try to get a spot in time. You may need to get creative and communicate staggered arrival times. Operations and logistics planning in this world are at a whole new level. When it comes to hybrid, you have one event but two very different and unique experiences that you have to cultivate. A hybrid event is not just setting up a camera and putting the in-person event online for people at home to watch. Consideration of how the virtual attendee will participate and consume that content and the experience that they're having from home is vital to the event of this, uh, event's success. TV has been doing this successfully for so many years, especially in award shows and sporting events. In my past life at the Air Canada Centre, there was a whole team creating that in-person experience. There was game operations, halftime entertainment, mascots, dancers, content on the jumbotron, in-seat contests, live action on the ice court and field, in-seat service for food and beverage, and the list goes on. At the same time, there were hundreds of thousands of people that didn't have a ticket to attend that game who are experiencing it from their own home, bar, via TV or computer. These virtual attendees have had the added benefit of the sideline interviews pre and post game, the play-by-play -play announcer, the color commentators with those interesting stats and antidotes during any downtimes. There's the slow motion action shots and highlight reels. And once again, the list is endless. Same game, two very different experiences. That's how you need to think about a hybrid event. Many elements used in the sports analogy can be used throughout your, your event. As weird as it may sound, Event apps are a great inclusion for your event, depending on the size and type. They can be used to increase engagement, and mobile definitely comes in handy if you're doing a hybrid event. The technology can be used to bridge the gap between in-person attendees and virtual attendees to create a shared, interactive experience. Session Q&A features on an app can be used by both online and in-person attendees. Live polling can also be used with both audiences to engage with speakers. Most event apps have networking features that can be used for one-to-one -one or group chats among attendees. And gamification in apps can bring attendees together in a shared, fun experience with points, leaderboards, and prizes. Push notifications can be used to share session information. But don't forget, the communication needs to be tailored for the type of attendee receiving it. You need to ensure the content viewable to attendees within the app is relevant to the way that they are participating in your event. As planners, it's important that we have people facilitating these connections with all of our event attendees. You still need someone to be responsible for managing event app communications. As we mentioned earlier, conferences and meetings aren't the only style of events that have gone virtual or hybrid. Historically speaking, many start and scale companies use trade shows to build their sales funnel and show off their products. This opportunity may look different than it did last year, but many trade shows have moved to a virtual platform, or in some cases, a hybrid version, so you can choose whether to exhibit in person or virtually. Whereas before, you would have spent a large chunk of budget on a physical booth, participation fees, and team travel, you can now divert those dollars into creative assets for a virtual booth and develop your content. This is a great opportunity to develop some assets like white papers, demonstration videos, videos about your company or services that can be included at your virtual booth. The bonus is, is that these don't have to be single-use assets. They can be used as part of other marketing and communication efforts. Everyone knows CES, the largest annual trade show for innovation. It happens every year in January. Anyone who has experienced CES understands the crowds, the product demonstrations happening on the trade show floor, and the shoulder networking events. We also know that CES attracts over 170,000 attendees per year. That's a lot of people in one convention center. CES 2021 will be very different. For January 21, they plan to provide a fully digital show experience. And CES 2022 is already talking about a hybrid, digital, and in-person experience. Virtual trade shows have become the new way for companies to be able to communicate to others. So what is a virtual trade show booth? It is a customized and branded 3D build of your company's trade show booth placed across a virtual environment. Visitors can come explore the surroundings, stop at booths to further engage, and learn about products similar to what has been experienced on a trade show floor. 
Virtual trade show booths allow you to amplify your marketing for attendee engagement. And they give you an opportunity to include things like product demos, videos, 3D animated branded content from virtual LED walls and holographic displays. And digital brochures include clickable and interactive displays. With proper planning, content generation for your virtual trade show booth can then be used for future physical trade show booths and or digital website content. It is important for companies with virtual trade show booths to spend the time and money to develop really great graphics and really think through what, how you're leaving the impression on the visitors to your booth. It all comes back to maintaining someone's attention span and leaving an impression. Content is still key to success and you still need to work the show. You and your team still need to be scheduled um, accordingly to work your booth and chat with attendees and answer questions in real time. What is their takeaway and how are you following up with them uh, post-event to make an impact? The images on these slides have been provided to us by GoTo Productions based out of Vancouver. They're a team of experts in the field of 3D projection mapping, immersive environments, videos and experiential projects. Another area that's been using virtual for some time now is fundraising. Most, if not all, charitable organizations run campaigns to which fundraising events are in integral. These organizations are quickly switching gears to host a combination of virtual, in-person distance, and hybrid events to support their causes and raise funds. The Cambridge Food Bank, for example, ran a virtual food and fun drive this past spring, where they encouraged people to host video chats, online games nights, or virtual concerts, and collect funds to support the food bank. This weekend, August 15th and 16th, Kitchener Rib Fest is happening. But it's happening a little bit differently. Because of COVID, this year's Rib Fest is a drive through It's happening at the Kitchener Memorial Auditorium. How it will work is that you drive in, select what you want to order, pay, and you'll receive your order all while remaining in your vehicle. You can then enjoy your ribs at home. Entry is free, but donations of cash and non-perishable items are being collected for the Food Bank of Waterloo Region. Charitable galas can also go virtual or hybrid and offer food delivery from local restaurants, along with virtual entertainment. Silent and live auctions have had virtual capabilities for some time now. Fundraising platforms have been used by many organizations to provide event attendees with text-to-give options, as well as mobile bidding. The great thing about this is that fundraising can begin pre-event and it can carry on for some time post-event. Online fundraising platforms make it simple to execute auctions with the ability to upload images of auction items and bidding being done within an app or website. Many of our technology platforms also offer end-to-end -end solutions where your whole event can run through one system. It offers registration, live streaming capabilities, and more. And these are just a few of the many online fundraising platforms available. Even with a virtual event, you'll want to review the data. Whether you use some or all of these marketing paces, you'll still be able to garner insights of your customers that will allow you to plan for future marketing efforts. Google Analytics on your event website traffic, which is especially helpful after triggering communications. Email click-throughs are good to know, especially if you're doing A-B testing on emails. Registration, check-ins, attendance is great to know how many and who came, but it's also particularly important for contact tracing of any delegates who've attended an event in person, such as in a hybrid version. You need to ensure you're capturing all attendee contact details. You'll want to track engagement during the event through session attendance, and if you're using an app, you can see participation in live polls, Q&A, networking, and games. And finally, post-event insights are provided through surveys or sales figures and product adoption and loyalty. The benefit of all the real-time data is that digital sponsorships are optimized for analytics. The type of events we are hosting at the moment might have changed, but the reason a company is going to sponsor remains the same, exposure to your specific attendee base. They want to capture that distinct market's attention. So as planners, we have to get creative on providing various sponsorship de deliverables, but the value is still very much there for the sponsors. The event platforms we use to host virtual and hybrid events gives us the ability to track and collect massive amounts of event data. When we can deliver that type of accurate information to sponsors, it creates a valuable ROI for them. We can now provide them with how many impressions they got, click-throughs, web traffic, and other conversion metrics. The data could be benchmarked against other marketing activities, giving marketers the opportunity to make informed decisions on where they spend their future budgets. This is a major competitive differentiator between virtual and in-person events. The ability to track engagement and the activity is gold. So that's a wrap for us. 
Uh, before we start taking questions, uh, we have a little quick setup to do. We just want to make sure that people aren't nervous about going into the virtual and hybrid event experience. These are still, there's still infinite opportunities out there to make an impact using events, and we just have to be really open and creative. Virtual events won't be going away, and companies are really seeing the value in that. Ultimately, though, we will eventually be able to get together again and enjoy events together from the same space. So you're going to see that hybrid model become more and more dominant in the eventing space. It isn't a new concept, but it's definitely going to become a very proven and accepted concept. No matter what type of event you are doing, focus on the attendees' experience and how your company can help enhance that throughout the entire process. We just want to say a really huge thank you to Communitech for having us today. Kristen and I had a great time putting this together for everyone. Also, a very, very special thank you to our friends at Sherwood here in Kitchener. Um, we've worked with Sherwood for many, many years, and they are some of the best in the business. And also, last but not least, a huge thanks to Eclipse Productions and Mark Patterson, he's right over there, um, for your guidance, your mentorship, and for being our director today. Um, so we are ready to pass the controls back to Christina, and if there are any questions coming through the chat, we're happy to take them. Thanks so much, ladies. So to the participants joining us today, thank you. And if you do have any questions for Kristen or Lena, please put them into the chat and I will do my best to moderate. We also um, received a number of questions um, beforehand, so I can also um, dive into some of those while you're typing your questions into the chat. Um, so I guess my first question would be, Kristen, um, if, if a if a CEO of a company is used to doing speaking engagements um, at conferences, how can they now in this virtual world um, continue to um, put their foot forward to, to attend conferences as a thought leader? Um, a lot of things haven't changed from virtual to in-person. So uh, you have to do the same amount of research. You have to be as prepared as you were before. Um, you need to make sure that somebody, if not the CEO directly, but somebody's reaching out on their behalf to make sure that um, they're getting their name out there. So as long as they're prepared to start speaking, they've got a bit of a portfolio. Um, I always say that speakers should always have some sort of highlight reel. Um, now we should be adding the virtual highlight reel in there as well because presenting virtually is a lot different than presenting live. And as a, an event planner, um, I would really want to see those two different um, styles. So not a lot different. Uh, but just adding that little piece into it would be really important. So reach out, do your research, and make sure you're prepared so when they are reaching out back to you about speaking, um, that you're ready to go, you know your topics, and go from there. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a question that's come in from Matt. How useful is a visitor management system in the current workplace event climate? Seems crucial for contact tracing. Yeah, I would... I would say a, um, sorry, a visitor management system. Um, you absolutely, on registration, need to be capturing um, personal information so that you can contact Trace um, after the fact. So I would say that um, for any, any events or meetings that you're hosting, you should have some way of knowing who's in your building um, or who's at your event at any given time, arrival time, departure time, et cetera, as much detail as, as you can possibly track. Um, and you don't necessarily need to have a system that can be done in, uh, in a sheet or an Excel spreadsheet uh, as well, but I, I think as long as you're um, tracking everyone's information, that's what's important. Kristen, do you have anything to add to that? I think there's going to be the use of technology. Um, it's really going to depend on your budget and what you can and can't do. Um, so those are great if you have the budget to be able to afford one, um, but there are also options to be able to continue on with those pieces that um, don't cost as much money. So it's going to be dependent on what you have to spend. Thank you. We have another question here. What online event formats have stood out to you? And is there a specific event that was well formatted? 
Yeah, there are a ton of platforms. Um, so I think for us, we've done a lot of research into a lot of the different platforms. It's really what are you trying to do and how, how many features do you actually need? Um, so we've been using Hopin to have some really great success with that. Um, there is two versions of Hopin as well. So once again, budget. Um, there's the cheap and cheerful one that's I think $100 American a month. Um, it has a ton of features, um, really easy to use. It hosts the video, so you're not having to do that. Um, so it's a lot easier for your, your bandwidth. Um, but then there's an also a more expensive one that if you're looking to add all the technical side and production elements, um, you do have that option. So um, I would say for us, any virtual event that has um, great content, fast content, and like we mentioned in our presentation, that's run sort of like a broadcast because that's how I expect to receive information if I'm seeing it on a screen. Great, thank you. A um, few more questions coming in here. What are your thoughts on timelines in 2021 for returning to in-person for large events? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, that would be amazing to be able to see. It's, nobody knows that right now. I think there's some positive signs that things are opening up, not so much to the full large scale events that we might've had in the past, but definitely into a more hybrid model where people get to do a little bit more of a choose your own adventure sort of style. So if they're comfortable coming, um, having that live side of things, and then the people that just aren't comfortable coming out yet, but they still wanna be a part of the event, um, that hybrid model is going to be really cool for them. Really, until science tells us that we're ready to gather in big um, groups, it's going to kind of be up in the air for a little bit. I know personally, um, I don't think we're in the midst of thinking about planning large in-person events at this stage. Um, so it's really going to depend on what the health ministers tell us. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on sending branded promotional items or giveaways to those attending your virtual conference? Is this something that you would consider sending before a conference or use it during a gamification option? Or could you send it afterwards as a thank you? Yeah, I think anything that can come ahead of time is awesome because that just helps it amplify the excitement to it's a part of the attendee engagement, um, the excitement. I think any time that you have the budget to be able to do that, that's an awesome sort of um, add-on to any event. Um, and, it, and it does kind of show the experiential piece that I think we're all kind of looking for in the virtual events at this point. Yeah, and if you can add that kind of stuff to um, event gamification, that's even better because then you're curating a networking style situation. So. And you're also potentially adding a social media element to it. Um, people like to photograph um, their packages as they come. And uh, so you can add that whole pre and post conference um, piece to your event or pre and post event. Um, and so any kind of thing that you can build in, and, and that's something that uh, we've actually been talking about before, is just how do you involve the social media side of things and how do you involve the experience on social media? And there's been a lot of those kind of pieces coming where um, very large uh, festivals have been doing these kind of closed uh, music sessions, but it's the, the social media side of things that's been blowing up. So you can kind of see the communities coming together and very responsible sized groups. Um, and they're creating their own spaces and they're creating their own forums. And, and so there's anything that you can do to kind of create that um, organically or planned um, is, is awesome. Do you find that virtual events um, that are shorter in length or broken up into segments lead to better attendee engagement rather than longer events? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, just the way that everyone digests content on a screen, it, it needs to be high velocity, fast paced, um, bite sized pieces. Um, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the best. And, and as Kristen mentioned in um, our presentation, it, every piece of your virtual event has to be programmed. You, you cannot have, you can't just put a holder slide saying washroom break. You actually need to program that break um, for those that aren't necessarily running to the restroom or running to grab a snack. 
um, you need to have something running on your screen at all times. As events have ramped over the summer, have you seen any typical event components that don't scale well to digital, such as networking, entertainment, um, boothing, or icebreakers? Yeah, I think the, th the three that kind of come to mind is um, long agendas. Um, anything that we would have done in an in, in-person event, so like the 45 to 50 minute keynotes or um, the really long one person camera, one camera on, um, it hasn't been translating and that's really where you're losing people's engagement. Um, the other thing is uh, the unprogrammed network or unprogrammed breaks doesn't translate into the digital world. Um, people really always want to be entertained. Just think they're always watching TV. If a TV just turned off or was static, um, it, it's very jarring for them <laughs> at, at home experience. So you always want to make sure something's running, even if it's not super valuable content, um, but something to keep them engaged. Um, and then networking events that are strictly networking um, are having a lot of difficulties. And I think the reason is if somebody's coming to an event, they've, they've made the effort to drive there, um, put an outfit on, uh, <laughs> they, they give you a little bit more patience on um, feeling comfortable at an event, whereas virtually, if they get there and they don't feel comfortable with either the technology or how things are being run, they drop off right away. And so it's really hard to maintain that engagement. If you can be doing stuff that um, brings them in and gets them comfortable, um, they don't have the food and beverage to kind of turn and go and grab a drink before they are comfortable in the room. So thinking those processes out um, has to be a little bit more curated than just opening up a space um, virtually and letting people just go with that. Yeah, and I really think you need to know your audience and whatever, whatever you can do to speak to your specific audience, um, the better. So even if in the virtual world, if you're creating specific breakout rooms for a certain type of audience or, or people that might have something in common, um, I think that, that could go a long way as well. We have another question here from Jackson. What about content intellectual property issues if hosting with third party softwares? Any thoughts on that? That is a good question. Um, I'm not sure that we're the ones to answer that. So uh, definitely something we could look into for you, Jackson, and um, host afterwards. But I wouldn't say that I would be comfortable answering that question. Yeah, that probably gets into some legalese and we'd have to do some research on that. We have another question here from Charlotte. What platforms do you recommend to have an inclusive international reach that would include audience from China or other countries that may not have access to the same platforms as in North America? So any tips to include international audiences? Uh, we haven't actually had to do the international side of things yet. So that is a great question. Um, the platforms are very good at explaining what they can and cannot do. So it's going to take a little bit of research on everybody's point. Um, it's also going to be in the translation piece. Um, some platforms are going to have better um, translation methods. Um, so you can include a wider audience, a more diverse audience. Um, so yeah, I would say um, I would say look into some of the larger platforms like a Cvent. Um, they've just come out with a virtual event platform. On 24. Um, yeah, on 24 is a big is a big one. Um, Excel events, I believe, um, is another big platform. But looking into some of the larger platforms can probably offer a better international experience than some of the smaller um, Zoom, et cetera. Along the same lines, um, what do you need to consider for national events? So for instance, um, not being in the same time zone um, could be a challenge. Any recommendations around that? Yeah, well, that's the big one, is the time zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've dealt with that. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know other than, other than the time zone, um, just knowing your audience. So um, who is it that's attending your event and, and how, do they, how do they like to receive information? Um, how do you speak to that target market? Also language, with Canada being um, multi- um, there's a lot of different languages, French, English um, component. Uh, you do have to take that into consideration. So um, it really comes down to your marketing on that side, whether you are an exclusively English um, speaking event or if there is going to be some translation involved. 
Um, and the cool thing about that is an invent, an in-person event, um, the translation services are very expensive to be putting that in, and it's very um, individual. Uh, whereas in a lot of these platforms, um, especially the bigger ones, as we mentioned, they have um, internal pieces. So it's it's actually becomes a lot more open to people. Yeah. Um, how do events deal with high cost of content development? It's the really thinking through your content and making sure that you're investing where you should be investing. A lot of that content can be used elsewhere, so it's not a single use um, uh, investment on the company side or the speaker side. So. Yeah, I would say um, tapping into marketing. <laughs> uh, marketing might have a little bit more of a budget if, um, if the events and, and marketing pieces are, are split out at an organization. Um, because your assets and your content can live on, they can live on your websites, they can live um, at virtual booths if, if that's something that you're doing. Um, and they can also live on social. So really thinking through where that content can be used and where your budget can come from for that content. And how it can be broken down. So you can have a very long segment that has some bits that can be really pulled out, used for um, however you want to promote yourself. Um, but the yeah. social piece is huge. So. It takes a little bit more planning on that side um, because content creation, as we all know, is extremely expensive um, to be done very well. Uh, so making it so it's not single use is going to be super important for you. We have another question here. How do you see virtual trade shows being run in the coming months? Do companies book and rent space for their virtual um, showcase uh, booths? Um, or is it just um, how would they showcase their products, for example? Yeah, I would say um, some of the larger trade shows that companies would have attended, like for example, a CES, they have their own platform and they're selling space on that platform. So it's similar to how you would showcase in person. You're, you're purchasing a, a 10 by 10 or a 10 by 20 space and then um, there's a bunch of add-ons after that. So um, I think some of the larger trade shows, they're they will offer you the platform and you need to kind of fit your content into um, what you end up purchasing. So um, I would imagine that they will be offering different levels to organizations um, and then you can just create your content for that. And the cool thing about that for an events person is it becomes way more of a marketing thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, marketing really has to be involved in that trade show booth. Um, the events side really is about the execution, so making sure that you know the plan on um, preparing your, your, the people that are at the booth, uh, making sure that there's a schedule, um, what is the uh, follow-up and how fast does the follow-up happen. And then marketing is really going to take the creative side of it and, and make sure that things are looking good, they make sense. Um, it's not long drawn out content, once again, it's bite-sized pieces. Um, and so a lot of it doesn't change from, I mean, there's no travel to the space and all of those pieces, but the actual process is very similar. Um, you'll see a very kind of one-to-one -one base on that. You have to do the research, you have to buy the space, you still have to put the work in behind it. Um, but it's a really great opportunity to create some beautiful assets, um, graphics, videos, white papers, etc. And you do have the opportunity to get the big booths or the small booths. Once again, um, as in most things event-based, it's about budget. You can do absolutely anything you want if you have the money. Um, there is the cool thing about virtual is that it doesn't always cost, uh, it shouldn't always cost the same amount. Um, and you can do things cheap and cheerful and make it look really professional without spending a ton of money. Um, so it, the eventing world becomes a little bit more accessible to a startup um, that is looking to showcase a, a product or a, be a thought leader somewhere, um, which is kind of a fun new element. Um, speaking of um, you know, cost for events, uh, we ha are asking for advice here or suggestions on charging fees for delegate attendance. So in the past, um, they had had in-person conferences where they charged like $100 per delegate. 
And now they're considering offering it for zero dollars um, and facilitating an option to donate to you know COVID relief or other other um, other charities. What would what would your thoughts on that be? I like the donation part. I think somebody um, to get some sort of attendance, you do need to ask them to put a credit card into a platform. <laughs> so um, with in person, it's about 35% drop off. Um, for people that registered that don't actually come to free events, whereas if they've paid even ten dollars, um, you start seeing at only a ten percent um, no-show rate. Uh, virtual is the same, and it's so much easier at home to get distracted um, and and forget about the event or start the event and get pulled away by 101 different reasons. Um, so. Anytime somebody has to put a credit card in, even if it's only $10, um, you're going to see a higher engagement rate. And the fact that uh, charity, philanthrop, phil oh, I can't say that word, um, <laughs> not even going to try, uh, but the charitable side of things, um, it's super important right now. And I think we're all sort of looking at um, where we can put our dollars there. So I think that's a great idea. Another question here, what advice do you have for facilitating effective networking opportunities during virtual events? Um, so once the speaker Q&A portions are done, how do, you, how do you kind of get the ball rolling to get people networking? Yeah, so it's really important to be able to have those profiles really worked in to, um, so making sure an attendee has really filled out their profile link um, so people know who's in the room. Um, they will have done some research. Any good networker is going to do some research behind that. Um, yeah, I would say um, gamification opportunities um, are, are really big. We've, uh, we've heard of people having trivia. Um, that's actually something that can be done during breaks is, is just having, having trivia, having specific breakout rooms um, for, with specific content. Um, and having the preset um, tables that share some of those interests, so if it's sales or wh whatever the focus is, making sure that you're curating the experience within that networking. Once they're comfortable, they'll be far more open to spreading out and finding their own way, choosing their own adventure. Um, but I think in virtual, you really have to kind of lead them to the water if, or the table. <laughs> and get them to start um, in one section and then break out from there. So um, curated experiences really are however it's going to break that down. Um, but to leave it just open is a bit of a problem that w from what we've been seeing. What are some examples of ways to continue to deliver value to partners for virtual events? So I think here they're asking about delivering value to sponsors of events. Well, um, as we mentioned, the data alone that virtual or even the hybrid events um, come anytime that there is, you can count clickables and you know where people are and how long they stay uh, for the most part. So that information for sponsors is huge, um, but it is getting creative. You don't want your event to just be splashed with logos everywhere. Um, logo soup is never a good thing, uh, <laughs> never recommended, uh, but there's a ton of different things that you can do as far as um, having a sponsor do a pre-recorded 30-second um, intro. Uh, so it's kind of commercial-like, but it's more about why they're sponsoring. So it's not about their product, it's not a sales, it's really why they're involved in the event. Um, so it provides them some, some related to the thought leadership side of things. Um, there's obviously um, Lower thirds, anytime you're using any graphics, um, you can keep sponsor logos as a little bug in the corner. Uh, you see that with like CTV, it's always there. You always know what channel you're watching. You always know what sponsor is sponsoring that session. Um, there's, there's a lot if you're creative and you think outside of the box. And I think where some of us are struggling right now is, well, we did this piece in an in-person event, how do we translate that out? And, and you can have sponsors sponsoring parts of your event, like breakout sessions um, or networking opportunities, um, so that in the virtual world, they are very much present. They're at the table. They're uh, invited to the table. So as long as we can get creative, and, and there's a whole new world out there for us to do that, um, your sponsors are going to see a lot of ROI in that, especially just because of the data that you can give them.
Yeah, and we mentioned um, in our presentation, event apps can also be an, a thing um, for virtual events, and, and that's a great sponsorable item. Um, Kristen mentioned the, um, the technology, branded technology that you can send to, to speakers, and, and maybe that's something that can be sponsored too. Exhibit floors, they can have a part, be part of the exhibit floor. Um, it really all comes down to what are you charging them and um, yeah. what, what is their value proposition to be at your event. Um, there's the virtual grab bags or the, um, as somebody asked about the sending swag ahead of time, they can be a part of that piece as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's still based on impressions in terms of the value of the sponsorship. Going back to um, companies um, having booth space at virtual conferences, um, looking for some tips here around um, if a company rep is speaking with a delegate one-on-one, -on -one, how does the company rep also manage and retain new traffic in and out of their virtual booth? So they're just trying to figure out some tips for managing traffic and sharing information simultaneously. Um, for virtual booths, I do think you need more people to be, man um, to be at the booth. Mm -hmm. um, it's not where there can be a, when you're at an in-person event, people can obviously see you're talking to somebody and they kind of understand the cues of when you're kind of coming in and out. Virtual is a bit different on that side. So having more people that are available to pick up questions um, because the impact is really quick. Um, if somebody's not comfortable, once again, they can just drop off and there's no social um, engagement. They, it doesn't matter. You don't watch them walk away. It's literally they're off your screen. Um, so to, ha to know what your impact is, have more people available and in shifts. Um, have them very well versed in what they're, they're saying, um, so scripted or whatever that is. Um, your impact's going to be a lot higher. And then the other thing that we're seeing is um, the amount of time that you can follow up with them um, so that it's fresh in their mind. So if the follow-up can almost be immediate, um, so you have somebody in the back end doing the follow-up right away, um, those are all going to increase your lead gen um, dramatically. Um, just looking here at what questions we have left. Um, how would you recommend connecting the in-person um, and virtual audiences for a networking during hybrid? So if you have people who are attending virtually and people who are attending in person, is there a way to connect those two audiences with each other? Yeah, absolutely. Event apps. Um, that's a really great way to, to bridge the gap between the two audiences. Because as, as we mentioned in our presentation, they are two very different experiences, but that is the one bridging piece that, uh, that can be used to, to bring people together. And it's used in person events as well. So I think that a lot of the points that we get to is um, things in person events and things used in the virtual world they really do. People are comfortable with an event app. They understand it. They know how to use it. Um, and so that is the bridging gap, gap bridger. Um, how do you keep events engaging for youth? So, in, for example, in the 14 to 20 age range. Yeah, so... Um 14 to 20 is actually, it's only six years, but it's actually a pretty wide age range when you think about maturity levels. So um, in the absence of just um, targeting 14 year olds or just targeting 16 year olds, if you are truly talking about the 14 to 20 range, then um, I would say that their brains are very much wired to take in a lot of information um, in bite-sized pieces, so think about 140 characters. Um, so you, you really want to look at high-velocity information, very entertaining, and wherever you can gamify it, even better. When you pivoted to the virtual event world, what are some things that caused you the most heartburn uh, when thinking about virtual events versus in-person? Well, for me, personally, um, it was really around the technology platforms. Um, there was just, there, it was a big learning curve um, because my background is operations and logistics and dealing with event venues. Um, the new event venue is, is your platform. So just that, that learning curve, there's, there's a lot out there. They all offer different things. Um, 
and we're just we're continually learning on that piece. I would say mine was definitely the experiential piece. Um, early on, we shifted very fast. So events that were supposed to be in person are all of a sudden um, not, and they're on a screen. And so I kind of feel they didn't, they didn't have the opportunity to really think through because they're almost taking an in-person event agenda and just flipping it to virtual, and it's not a positive. Um, so mine was really how do we provide those experiences for the audience and the speakers? Um, so it's really white glove, right, all the way through for everybody. Um, and so initially, to be honest, that was very nerve-wracking to think, can we even do that? Is that something that can be done? Um, for me, it was the easiest way was when it, we started thinking of the, the TV analogy and sports and w award shows and how they've really been able to do that. There's very much an at-home experience for those people. And uh, we, we even want to watch the commercials in those kind of pieces. So uh, that has helped frame it in my mind that things can be very positive in a virtual environment. I know we only have a few minutes left, um, but we do have somebody asking um, if you could quickly break down um, as an example, how you accomplish setting up for today's event. So is there a quick kind of checklist of, um, of things that people should consider? Or what were your top considerations when setting up for today? Well, the COVID restrictions obviously are um, safety first. Um, so making sure that the crew is safe, um, we're safe, um, that we're not putting anybody in an awkward situation. So um, we're in a warehouse. Sherwood's warehouse is, is very large. Um, so Lena and I could literally be on opposite sides. So that was one. Um, we talked a lot with Sherwood and Mark um, to just figure out how to deliver the experience. So. It's a webinar, um, but it doesn't have to be boring. And I think that was one of our biggest things is we just wanted to, um, with the resources we had, and I mean, Sherwood's a huge resource, and I would honestly recommend anybody working with them, uh, but just planning things out um, for what makes sense in the content, how to deliver the content, how to make sure it's fast, how um, engaging, all those pieces. And I would say, you know, our process from from start to finish we 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 storyboarded what we uh, what our story needed to be what we wanted to talk about um, we developed a script so like any like putting together content for any event we treated this like a true event we didn't want to be a talking head on a screen for 30 minutes and we wanted to make sure that we were putting um, engaging content up and quick snippets with really great light really great light with light so many cameras. <laughs> As a follow-up to that, um, we have somebody who's interested in knowing how much time went into preparing for this 20 to 25 minute presentation. That is funny. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so a lot of time went in. Uh, Lena and I are not natural presenters. So uh, for us, we are very much behind the scenes people. So to be on screen, um, the required time versus the time that we put in would be very different. So um, everything that we do, we always, we fill every gap. So we walk through it a hundred times. Um, we do this with events as well. So the presentation for us is no different. Um, it's making sure the gaps are closed. Anything that's gonna trip us up or that we're aware that's gonna trip us up, we go through that. Um, so personally, this did take a lot of time uh, but it's very important to show that um, there's little things that can be done and you don't have to go to this scale um, to just make your event really, or your meeting or any of those things really great. And uh, if you take anything away, it's make sure you're prepared, make sure that you have really great strong logistics and really great content. And it doesn't matter, you don't have to spend a dime beyond whatever that costs. Um, that's literally just keeping things tight and fast. Yeah, but I do highly recommend a studio space. Oh yeah. Um, if you can swing it within your budget, honestly, that takes away that whole headache for anyone just having to um, deal with with the tech of of an event. And and honestly, the the guys at Sherwood, like this is a very raw space um, that they've turned into a, a distanced studio for us, and and they're happy to do that for anyone. 
Okay, thank you so much. We are at um, the top of the hour. We're getting a lot of comments here um, on how great the session is and how engaging it has been. So I want to thank you both very, very much for your time and energy in putting this together. Um, I want to remind the audience again that if you'd like to connect with Lena or Kristen um, to, you know, um, talk through any of your events, um, you can connect with them on LinkedIn or find them at birchgillette.com. Um, they'd be happy to, to meet with you and discuss your needs. Um, and we will be following up um, after the, today's session with a copy of their presentation. Um, and some of you are asking for some resources as well. Um, so perhaps we can include some go-to resources for somebody looking to get started with virtual events. Um, and we will, we will send that along. So I wanna thank everybody again for their time today, joining today's session. And once again, Lena and Kristen for your time. And we hope to see everyone again soon. Thanks everyone.